Jason, Sarah Callier, Killa and Rebecca Coriel, Orin and J.P. Hunt, Merlin and Nancy Jones, and Brianne Moore. And thank you for this increase, Lord. Thank you for making us stronger. But help us, Lord, to remember that uh, you are not just the author of our faith, but you are also the finisher, finisher of our faith. And, and Lord, that you produce in us these testimonies of faith and that you want them to be heard, but also to be seen. So help us, Lord, to help one another to live out our faith, to pursue you, Lord, and to grow in you. Grow as godly men and grow as godly women, Lord. Just, just help us in that, Lord. And uh, so we just we just praise your name this morning. And uh, again, Lord, thank you for all that you are and all that you desire us to be through you. In your name, amen. 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 So it's <clears throat> it's time for round two, so to speak. Uh, so at this time we have nine other individuals who desire to, to join our church family uh, by way of testimony slash experience. Uh, again, you can see that order uh, in that white piece of paper. Uh, we're going to start with Jason and Sarah, Sarah Callier and invite them up. And if Philip and Rebecca, if you guys could come over here to the piano while you're waiting for Jason and Sarah. Uh, and then when Jason and Sarah are done, invite Philip and Rebecca to come right up. Uh, and Orin and JP, when Philip and Rebecca come up, if you guys could just be up here already, ready to go. And we'll keep, keep moving it that way, okay? All right, so I didn't write anything down, so hopefully I don't mess this up too much. But uh, my husband, Jason, and I have been coming to Orangeville Baptist since uh, March of 2019. And... Um, We've been blessed ever since we've been coming here. Um, when I was younger, I was blessed to be able to grow up in a Christian home with parents that love God. My dad is a pastor, so I was also a pastor's kid growing up my whole life. And um, I remember going to my mom around the age of eight and asking her how I can make sure that I'm going to be in heaven forever with them and with Jesus. And, you know, we grew up reading the Bible, and I knew John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And um, that day I asked God to come into my heart and save me. And um, thankfully I spent my younger years going to church uh, with my parents, my family. And um, uh, when I was in graduating high school, they sent me off to Pensacola Christian College, and I spent five years there. And thankfully, it was it was probably the closest that I'd grown in my walk with God, you know, since I had become a Christian. But we had a lot of good teaching there in chapel. And um, sorry, I'm nervous, but I talk in front of people all the time at work. I'm a nurse, so I don't know why I'm nervous today. But um, Anyways, I went to college, and during my first semester, I started out as pre-law, and um, I was shared a verse with a roommate, and it was Jude 22, um, which says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. And my, um, my career decision changed, and I went to study nursing at that point, and so for the past 16 years, I've been able to serve God through that and also serve people through that which I've been very blessed. Um, but probably, I guess you could fast forward, maybe, I don't know, seven years later, I met my husband in 2011. In 2012, we got married, and um, probably for the first three years that we were married, we really didn't attend, attend church regularly. We would go occasionally, um, but we, we knew that we were missing something and that we needed to find a church family. So we started going to a local church, and we went there for probably about two years, maybe maybe a little bit longer. Um, but we did we weren't really getting the convicting message that we felt like we were getting. We kind of would walk in and walk out, and felt like we were we could just blend in and kind of be with the crowd. 
Um, but we went there for a couple years, and we, we thought, well, maybe we'll try another church and see what that's like. So we went to another church for about a year, and we kind of were feeling the same thing um, with that church. We, we enjoyed going there, but we kind of blended in and blended out, and we didn't have any accountability to go every Sunday because people didn't know whether we were there or not. And um, at least that's kind of how we felt. And my dad told me, and he, he said, I've been telling you guys for the past three plus years, Pastor Dan is a great pastor. Go to Orangeville Baptist. It's two miles down the road from you guys. You, you need to try it out. And uh, from the first Sunday that we came here, we had people introduce themselves and welcome us in the service. And ever since then, you know, there can't be a Sunday that we come here if we're not here. You know, Frank and Irene especially, they always notice whether or not we're here. And um, anyways, we just really have enjoyed this church and we hope to become members today. I'm a lucky man to have her, obviously. Um, this is a package deal, too. You can't take the pretty one and not the big hillbilly. So, uh, I'm lucky to have her, but I'm also ultimately lucky to have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, that did not come easy. Uh, I will say that I've gone to church my whole entire life. I was brought up in a very strict religious home. Before I get into my testimony, I want to share a verse from Psalms 50:15. That means a lot to me. And you're going to realize why it does. Call upon me in the time of trouble. I will rescue you, and you shall glorify me. And hopefully I'm going to glorify you, uh, the Lord here, Jesus Christ, my Savior. The home I was brought up in was so strict that they'd beat the sin out of you and beat the Jesus into you. That's the way it was for me to bring it up. And it made me believe that it was a very hypocritical thought of Christianity. And by the time I was in high school, there was one man that was a youth leader in Sunday school. That man changed while I'm standing here today because he saw how hard it was for me at home. He knew I was struggling. And he, he's a guy that uh, they were referred to in the late 70s and early 80s as a Jesus freak. Or an old hippie that was uh, now a youth leader teaching uh, kids to follow Jesus. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in his class. That set me up for the foundation of the rest of my life. When I go back to that verse, you'll understand why that I just shared with you. Because even after I was saved, it was not easy. Because time at age 17, I was homeless. And it wasn't by choice. Good heart of some great people, as well as serving my country, I was able to finally get through college. And then I turned on to wear a uniform for almost an hour, 30 years in law enforcement and the fire service. During that time, I was blessed with three beautiful children, and I was married before. I messed up that marriage, and it cost me dearly, the sin did. My children are all saved. One became a missionary. One's going into nursing. And unfortunately, my only son at the age of 23 passed away three years ago. I met this beautiful woman next to me after my partner was shot and killed. And she was a nurse that removed his gun belt from his dead body. I've survived so much tragedy. I've seen so much pain and suffering that Jesus Christ has brought me back to him several times on my knees. To lose a child is nothing more worse, and I know there's many people in here, unfortunately, that have experienced that as well. I know for a fact, and no doubt, that God had a plan for me living through everything that I've lived through and everything that I've experienced, such tragedy. And the reason I'm standing with this woman here today was brought forth by tragedy, and hopefully to a blessing for many more years. Without Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, I do not believe I would be standing here right now. A large period of dealing with all those terrible things for me in my life was dealt with and medicated with alcohol. I always went to church, but I medicated myself with alcohol when I left. And it took me a long time to turn that over to Christ before I finally was free from that and was able to 
actually admit it and as well as stand in front of a crowd at the same time. I don't have enough time and uh, I, I feel almost guilty. I, I did an interview here this past uh, spring on the radio for a podcast uh, reference loss of my child. That was over an hour, so I'm sorry. But uh, I'd like to share one thing here when I conclude here. About a year and a half ago, someone was talking to me in this church. And uh, after a conversation, they said, you've experienced so much tragedy, pain and suffering in your life, and you've seen and you've dealt with so much. You've had people try to kill you. You've been through all these terrible things. He says, in your job, he says, have you ever just thought about quitting? I was like, you don't pay my bills. <laughs> it was awful to be in that, and I just recently retired this summer uh, after my service. My response to that is, sometimes God pits Christians in really bad situations, and bad things happen to Christian people sometimes. But God puts us there for a reason so we can glorify him later on. That we can get up. We can be a second Corinthians. We're talking about what? We're getting trials to show that we can endure so we can get comfort from the Lord so we can provide comfort to those that are going through trials like us that are similar. My question to that and that sharing that response in today was is what are you doing to share the Lord during your troubled times and be a witness at that time? Are you sharing your trials to be a comfort to others as well when they're going through trials that you did? Thank you. I do not claim to know the exact date to which I was saved, yet I do believe that God was working in my heart as a young adolescent. That is when God began to give me new motivations and new desires for His will and way. As imperfectly as I tried, and ignorant too, because there was much of a lack of knowledge, as the scripture goes, my people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge, I too felt it was a similar case. Though just short of destruction as you see me here today, by God's grace, I'm here and I'm growing in the knowledge of our wonderful Savior, which is Jesus Christ. My past is filled with many times where I took solitude in the imaginary, where I ran away from reality and life, in television and in games, taking to the world of the characters whose lives seem so much more happier than mine, where they fix their problems with their fists and they seem to enjoy the things of the world so unabashedly. What a lie to believe and unrealistic. Violence and anger and materialism swallowed me whole, taking to myself a collection of trinkets and entertainments, filling up the void I knew would and could only be filled by God. And these same temptations still pop up like whack-a-mole in my mind every so often. Only now, it is the sword of the Spirit of God that thwomps these rebellious fleshly varmints. Each time I looked at the past, God cuts my heart and allows for repentance, then cauterizes my chest with his refining fire, purifying me ever so surely. My spirit has become new, born again by his grace. My desire is for his love and his face. I tremble at his work in me, for I am not my own, and it is the Almighty God who has his way with me. As I look back, this world will always let you down. It's all finite. It is only God who can satisfy us. God is infinite, and we as humans have an infinite desire which cannot be satiated with finite things. My life has been one of running from reality. God is reality. Reality can be scary when we are living in evil. The sin of hatred for everyone, which is what I lived in, everyone was out to get me, it felt like, 
And yet I know now it's a lie. Perfect love drives out all fear. And reality is my solace. God is my solace and he is love. God fills me with his joy and peace. And I need not fear this world and hide in sin in the realm of distraction and illusion. Now I eagerly watch in the morning hours of the first glimpses of his face, which set the day ablaze. I've been given a cloak of righteousness that does not stain and was bought with the blood so precious as to stain me white as snow. My righteousness is not my own. My life is not my own. All glory must go to God, for it is only God where any merit can be found. I am thankful for my Lord and Savior Jesus, who saved me, and I am grateful to share part of this story with you all. May I share more in person. Amen. Pure rebellion, that was my life before Christ. I knew full well God had existed. I simply chose to ignore the obvious. My foolish anger and resentment toward God had, God had grown within me throughout the years, blaming him for my sin as well as the sin of others surrounding me. It wasn't until I was at a dead end in my life when he, tr he made me truly realize how, how very foolish I was, running away from him and running away from his glory. I was always happiest when I felt like I was needed and when I felt like I belonged somewhere, even if it was for a short period of time. I thrived on acceptance from other people, which led to my own downfall. When I was 16, my parents had gotten a divorce. Both had chosen their new relationships as priorities, my, young, my three younger brothers and I. At this time, my grandparents and my aunt opened up their home to me due to my mom being unable to support me. They did so so they could bring me to church and talk to me about God. Romans 1, 20 and 21. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their own speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. This verse rings so true in my own life. I knew God, but I chose bits and pieces of the world to ignore him, until one day my, at my grandparents' church, I knew I couldn't run away anymore. In Del Tackett's Is Genesis History, he speaks with a microbiologist by the name of Kevin Anderson. In the clip, Dr. Ander in the clip with Dr. Anderson, Anderson speaks of a fragmented triceratops worm that had remaining tissue with cells and potential proteins such as collagen. They found this triceratops horn in Hell's Creek, an area where it's warm during the day and cold at night. A change in temperature such as that would destroy the tissue very fast, hard enough to imagine it lasting 4,000 or 5,000 years, let alone 60 million or 70 million years. That was absolutely mind-boggling to me. Although I didn't hardly believe the Big Bang had ever happened, Finding out the true history of dinosaurs gave me absolutely no more reason to continue down a path where I was constantly running away from the obvious, the creator of the universe. Although I can't compare myself to the word perfect, I still try, by God's grace, to live like his son. He has changed my life in so many ways, helped me realize that the basic fact that I'm alive today is a blessing in itself. He has changed my views on where I stand and problem to the world not to be a people pleaser, but to be his child. On bad days, I have to remind myself that I bear Christ's name and my decisions and actions should bring glory to him because he's the only one that deserves any glory. stayed up all night, so I'd be sure to be here on time. <laughs> well, what was my life like before I met the Lord? 
Well, the story. I was saved when I was 10 years old. So I'm not, you know, what can you do when you're 10 years old? I'm sure I displeased the Lord because I was really, really strong-willed. But that's the way Dad was raising his daughters because he had seen his mother terribly mistreated by his dad. And so he wanted to raise his daughters so that they would have a backbone and wouldn't be put in that kind of a situation and put up with it. So that's how I started out. Uh, what did I think about Christianity? Well, at that young age, I didn't think much about it. So, and uh, I grew up attending Sunday school. Both of my grandmothers were Christians. And I had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with each of them. And they always took me to Sunday school. And one day when I was with my paternal grandmother, she drove 100 miles every weekend to be with us, me, so that she could make sure that I went to church. And she prayed me into heaven. That's all there is to it. That's what she did. Um, then when I was in fourth grade, I began to, you know, to think a little bit about church when I went in Sunday school. But my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, who really, she did a lot of the raising of me. And she took me on her knee one weekend and she said, you know, it's time that you started to think a little bit about Jesus and what he did for you on the cross and why he did it. I just want you to think about it. I'll never forget that time. Never. And by the way, she lived until she was 91. The, minutes, uh, the church that I was attending was a small Baptist church in West Central Illinois. And our minister preached about heaven, hell, and sin, and what it meant to be a sinner and needing to be saved. He preached about the rapture and the tribulation and why it was so important to be saved. But you know what I did? I fought it for two years. And I would lie in my window at night. And it, this is just like it happened last night. I'd lie in my window at night, looking up at the stars and saying, Oh, Lord, don't come tonight. I'm not ready. I don't want to go to hell. You just can't. For two years I lived that way. I mean, I was scared to death. But I was all stubborn. Then, one Sunday morning, when I was 10, my heart, the, the pastor had preached, the invitation was given, and um, my heart was pounding so hard I thought it was going to just pop right out. And I said to myself, what's the use? Why am I fighting it? It's time I got saved. So all the way down the aisle to the front to meet the pastor, I was sobbing. He never could figure out why I was crying so hard. And I looked back up where my grandma was sitting and the tears were coming down her face. So that's how I got saved. It's wonderful. 
Then about, uh, let's see, next page. <laughs> Hang on, Pastor. Hang on, I promise I won't leave you in a lurch. My life really, really changed. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. And I had the best Sunday school teacher in the whole wide world. She taught me how to study the Bible, how to read it, and how to figure out what it meant. And she taught me about prayer and the Holy Spirit. Well, when you've got all that, I mean, you've got it. You can just grow and grow and grow. I was a snot, though. <laughs> I said was. I lie a lot, too. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're here today and maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't know the Lord, that's always a possibility. So I just want to tell you how to get saved. Number one, got to believe the Bible. Doggone it, it's true. And besides that, even if you might think it's not true, what if you're wrong? Hell is not a, a good place to be thinking about going. It's going to be suffering, suffering, suffering with fire. When Jesus died on that cross, he took your place and he took my place. And it had to be Jesus that died because he was the only one with sinless blood and that was the price for sin. That's what had to be paid in that way. And so... If you don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to believe me, but do this for me. Light a match. Pick a finger and put the match on your finger. How do you think that's going to feel? And just leave it there. You're not going to leave it there, are you? Because it hurts. Well, in hell, your whole body is going to be burning, and it's never going to burn up. And you don't have to go there. I mean, it isn't rocket science. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, doggone it, think about it pretty hard. Being a Christian's great. It's not always easy. But he's always with you, no matter what. And sometimes you're going to feel that he's not. But if you just take a minute and think about it, he didn't go anywhere. You did. You stepped away from him. That's when your confidence leaves. That's when Satan gets a hold. That's when you take wrong roads. So think about it. Now, I'm almost done. I have a bucket list item. After I make the rounds of heaven and renew acquaintances with loved ones, friends, and all the outstanding characters in the Bible, and if I have any crowns, the Lord's probably up there right now just shaking his head. Here she goes again. <laughs> I'll place them at my Savior's feet, and I'm going to worship him. Then I'm going to ask him where he keeps the horses. <laughs> Because they're probably going to be on the new earth. That'd be the logical place where he's going to have all the animals. And then I'm going to ask him if he'll ride on his powerful, beautiful white stallion that, that he comes with when he comes back to earth. And, and let me ride a beautiful, powerful black horse. And then we'll ride through the new earth together. We'll see all the animals and all the beautiful creation that he's made in the new earth. So, in closing, 
I just want to sing a chorus for you of There's Room at the Cross for You. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Oh, millions have come. There's still room for one. Yes, there's room, a lot of room at the cross for you. Well, that took up my time too. glad this is a little sturdy because I shake. Uh, thanks to my parents, they took me to church even in infancy. My dad was in the military so he wasn't home, but my mother and grandparents made sure that I was in church. Holy Spirit started to work with me in grade school when attending, I would get upset uh, in Sunday school with the boys that wanted to talk about sports all the time instead of talking about the Bible lesson. It, uh, I don't know, it's just the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I wasn't interested in the sports. Because I had heard Because I was hard-headed, it took until I was about 11 years old in a Sunday school service, or Sunday service, that the Holy Spirit grabbed my heart. And, I mean, he grabbed it hard. I knew all the scriptures, I knew all that stuff, but I just didn't do anything with it. And when he grabbed my heart, I went forward in the church and professed my, him as my savior, but that church did not believe in baptism until for young people until they requested it later. So I, with my being in the military, we moved all over the place. So it was in high school, I felt the call to, to ministry and I assumed that that would be on the pastoral lines. And I requested baptism at that time. Uh, I went for a, uh, I was talking to the, people at church about attending college and seminary, but the verses in the wisdom portions of the Bible about not being in debt uh, was held before my face, and there was no way I was going to college without going into debt, so I didn't do that. I went into the Navy. When I got out of the Navy, three years after getting out of the Navy, I got married. And the gal thought that I was, uh, she professed to be a Christian, and I think, thought that this was in God's plan. But after 14 years of struggle, counseling, and uh, whatnot, I realized that there was no way I was going to get my son to be in a position where he could be taken care of properly. So we went through with a divorce. 
and uh, the, all the churches that I had gone attended to leading up to that point, if you were divorced, you couldn't participate in any type of leadership. They might allow you, if under certain circumstances, to let you teach a Sunday school class. So we, JP and I, when we got together, eventually it evolved that we needed to make room for her mom. So we moved out here where we could afford to buy a place. And it took a while. We started, we attended off and on Orangeville Baptist Church for several uh, years. I worked night shifts and evening shifts and just didn't work out to regular attendance. But all that time, the Lord had a verse that is always in my face. That was 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8. That's the verses that describe what love is. And he, then I was laid up for three years and he did some more work on laying on my heart what, excuse me, what he wanted me to do. And then I talked to Pastor Dan about what I'd be allowed to do here. And he said, well, when that time comes, and the Lord leads the way, we'll approach it with grace. And that lifted my heart a lot. Then Pastor Andrew came on the scene and he had this vision of a counseling church. And that fell right in with what the Holy Spirit had been working on me for. And he offered a way for education in that line. So now that I'm in that position, I'm studying, I'm getting acquainted with the terrific people here. It was time. God had brought everything together. It was time for me to unite with this group here at Orangeville Baptist Church. Thank you. used to having a microphone. Well, my name is Nancy Jones, and I'm married to the six-foot-three giant here. But uh, I have a testimony to give to you that about my life when I first came to know the Lord as my personal Savior. My dad was a pastor, too. I'm a PK. I've grown up in a Christian home all my life. Um, my dad was preaching in a small church in Morrison, Illinois, and he had, we lived, the church part of it was just about as big as this, a little bit smaller than this auditorium, but we lived back in the overflow of the church. So I got to, when I was in a church, I always heard my dad preach. Well, the Lord, I was very young, I was six years old, I'd been sitting under his ministry, and the Holy Spirit began to really work in my heart. I mean, big time. It, it just really worked in my heart, just sitting under his ministry Sunday after Sunday. Well, one morning I was sitting there, and I just began to weep. I began to cry, and I didn't know why. Why was I crying? And then I had been, now I'd been sitting under his ministry, he had been talking about how to receive the Lord as your own personal savior. And I knew that at that time, that that was the Lord convicting me of my sin, and that I needed to ask Jesus in my heart. And so I didn't go forward or anything like that. But after the service, my mo I was sitting with my mother. She said, Nancy, I noticed that you've been crying, that you've been crying during the service. I said, yes, I was. I said, Mom, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. 
you know. She says, well, let me take you back into the living room. And we knelt beside the living room, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart at that time. Well, it was about three years later, we moved to another church in Boonville, Indiana. And that was where the Lord led me to follow him in baptism. And I went into the waters. I was very, it was very cold. I remember the water was just freezing. And we were dressed back then. You didn't wear pants, ladies. And my dress just went. A big balloon right in the water. Well, my dad, you know, he was, he says, I got to get this girl under. You know, it's, you know how the water, the water will hold you up, kind of. So he, well, he just shoved me right in the water like that. You know, I was so relaxed. I'm just like this, you know. And I said, oh, man, I just, you know, but I was so happy. I was so happy because I had done what the Lord wanted me to do. It was a blessing to see these young people up here take a step in baptism. It really, really was. So anyway, between the time after that, we lived in this church. This is where this one, it was, we'll go back to Morrison. We were in the church there, and there had been a big, we were right on a curve there, real busy highway. And we decided to take a ride in the afternoon. Our family did. So I thought, wow, that sounds like fun. Rides were the big thing back then. You know, so we all got in the car. We had an old Chevy, 19, I don't know what year it was, but an old Chevy. And we got in the car, but I did not shut the door on my side of the car. I didn't lock my door. And so as Dad pulls out of the garage, or of the driveway, my door flew open right on the spit where semi trucks are going along and I rode across the highway and I didn't realize what really happened and I rolled across the highway I was facing down onto the cement when I realized this isn't where I'm to be you know <laughs> and and so I looked at the cement and then I realized what I'm scared to death got up ran across the highway, and there was my mother waiting with me with open arms. But you know, the Lord could have taken me just like that. These two semi trucks were coming from one direction and the other direction, but they saw me fall out. And I, there was a lot of traffic going. And I ran up, I ran across the road, and uh, she met me there waiting for me. She was crying, my sister was screaming, and everything. But the Lord had saved my life, and I knew why he had done that, because he wanted me to serve him later on. And so I went on to Cedarville College, and I met this man at Cedarville in the practice room, music practice room at Cedarville College. And it's been, the Lord has read him, he's a now pastor, and the Lord has, we've had fun, haven't we, honey? Amen. Yeah, just, just serving the Lord, and and uh, the Lord just led us it's here now. We're in a retirement, and he's led us here in the greatest church. It's a wonderful church. So we're looking forward to worshiping with you. Amen. Well, I was raised in a Christian home as well as many who have given their testimony. And my, I had godly parents. I have written out my testimony because I have a tendency to preach, so I, I, wanted, I thought about bringing a big notebook. I didn't want Pastor Andrew to pass out. <laughs> um, my mom and dad were the real deal. Uh, they were really godly people, godly influences on my life. They gen genuinely lived the Christian life. I never heard my mom and dad ever cuss. I think the only time they ever lost their cool was with me. Um, <laughs> And uh, at four years of age, after a Sunday night service, I was very under conviction, uh, and uh, I didn't want to go to hell. I wrestled with that thought on my bunk bed until I got out of bed and went out to the living room where my mom was and told her I wanted to be saved, and uh, she led me to Christ. I knew uh, I was a sinner, even at that early age, so Nancy and I have a heart for children because we know uh, children can be saved and they can open their hearts to the Lord because we both have 
been saved at early ages. Um, uh, I remember praying and telling God that uh, uh, I wanted him to come into my heart. I was sorry for my sins and the Lord became my savior. I remember going to kindergarten the next day. I started school when I was four and I was just so happy I had to tell somebody about it. And so I came across somebody and I told them and, I, and they looked at me like, what are you talking about? And they, and I remember telling my mom and feeling very strongly uh, in our kitchen that God wanted me to be a preacher. And I knew that at age six. Um, but Satan also knew that God wanted to use me and he really messed up my life royally. I had some very bad things happen to me when I was seven. And uh, so much so that it messed up my thinking uh, and my walk with God. I thought I was no good. Uh, that, uh, and I began to act that way. I developed a terrible temper, got in a lot of fights, got in a lot of trouble. I had hate and anger in my life. And uh, from that point on, fights, rebellion, and secret sins continued into my early teen years. But even though Satan sought to destroy me, God never forsook me. So my testimony is not so much about my being saved, but about his grace and patience with me in keeping me saved and also uh, pursuing me. Uh, in response to a dare from a youth leader, and that's how I was wired, I began to read the Bible every night, not knowing that God was gonna use that to continually change my life. I also remember coming in late at night and seeing my dad and mom's bedroom window or light on and knowing, and they were reading their Bibles every night. And I knew that what they had was real. And so God began to change my heart and renewed my passion for him and for sharing the love of Christ with other people. Uh, God led me to go to Cedarville where I met Nancy. Uh, he renewed that call into the ministry in a, a boys dorm in a prayer meeting and God led me into the ministry where I served the Lord for now over 50 years. But um, we pastored at the uh, uh, Siegel Baptist Church. Some of you know that. I was there for seven years. By the way, I don't think we've ever joined a church. Yes. <laughs> I always started churches, so we just <laughs> became members. Uh, so we've never done this before. Um, but uh, we felt that God, uh, I, I helped Pastor Paul, who's there now, become the pastor there. And um, I thought that, uh, I told him I'd help him through that transition, which I did, but we felt that I, I ought to leave and go to a different church and serve. That was how I've always been wired. And I felt that I could have more liberty to do that. So we started attending here and um, we have felt at home here. We thank you for your hospitality. I just want you to know that uh, if you've, you're here and you've not yet trusted Christ as your savior, you haven't done so. And I've run across many people like this because you don't think you can live it. Well, I've got news for you, you can't. But I'm here to tell you that if you turn your heart over to Jesus, you trust him as your savior, he will live that life through you. He will keep you saved. He will help you to grow in him and have victory over those chains of sin that bind you. I am a testimony to that. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it or pursue it, perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Well, Merlin and Nancy may not have brought a notebook, but I did, so. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brianna Moore. Um, my husband Austin and his family have been attending here at OBC since the early 2000s. I'm grateful to have started attending here right before Austin and I had gotten married, and I have the pleasure of sharing this story with you guys today. So it's easy to talk about ourselves and what we've gone through, um, but this story is about the Lord's work, a small part of it, and how I'm the vessel that he's been using to be able to tell it. Let me start by saying this. Psalm 139 clearly states that we are intricately, purposely, and wonderfully made. 
That is true about all of mankind, all of us. The great creator thought through my personal creation. He knew I'd be a sinner, stubborn as can be. He knew I'd be a masterson growing up in a great family. He knew I would make mistakes time and time again, and yet he still lavishly loved me even when I didn't realize it. There was an appointed day he had for me when I would come to know him as my savior, but little did I know it would be a tug of war process for me. My family was great growing up, and I'm super blessed to have had the childhood I had. I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but my family was just awesome to live with. My mom was a single parent and worked hard to provide for us, whereas my grandparents were our biggest cheerleaders and always there for us when we needed anything. But my dad, he left before I could even speak, and I don't have a relationship with him today. But at an early age, I ended up adopting a lot of identity issues due to that, not understanding why a father could leave, how a father could leave, and also seeing my grandpa being the loving and loyal father that he was, it just didn't make sense to me. But little did I understand that God would use this profoundly in my life. I felt a void growing up, not knowing what was there and what needed to fill it. There was anxiousness, loneliness, self-doubt, and plenty of other things that riddled my life. And being a very imaginative individual, you could probably see where a mind like that could take very negative thoughts. Off and on growing up, we did go to church, but due to circumstances with my mom being a single parent, it wasn't something that was consistent. I did learn, however, at a young age that this God person was a pretty great guy. You know, he helped and loved people. So of course, that's something that I wanted a piece of. Mind you, it became a piece of something that I wanted only when I thought I needed it. And that's where that void continued to grow. As I grew older and life had its curveballs, I remember there being times where tears and pleads were sent directly to this God guy wherever he was. And that's part of that disconnect that continued to grow and gape this void larger and larger as I grew up. Well, like many teens, sin patterns began to intertwine in my life and the control I so loved to have, which was never really mine to begin with, began to control me. I craved what I wanted and the pleasure of life so soon consumed my flesh. Like many of you, you've heard from today, experience yourself or will endure in the future, I struggled with control, lust, anger, manipulation, slander, and that list continues on and on. But that's one of my favorite parts of the story, that I can relate to each and every one of you here. I allowed a hole from my dad's leaving, stress and self-esteem issues from a childhood abuse, shame from a terrible relationship to rule and identify who I was. But no, that's not how God saw me. Through friendships and what became some of the most important life-changing moments for me, I started at a youth group in my middle school years and ended up getting super involved. I served on the worship team, I was in the youth band, and wherever else they needed, I was there. Although I was, super, I was a super compassionate servant, it wasn't for God that I was serving, it was for me. It was not until the end of high school, after that church took a different approach, our youth group split, that my world was rocked. But through this trial, God blessed me with another friendship for me to finally understand we'll begin to see who he was. This time I saw that void in my life was there for a reason and I never could have filled it myself. Countless conversations caused tons of confusion in my mind, but I began to learn that there was more to God. There was Jesus, the only way to salvation. I learned that he died for me and desired me to not only know him but to have a relationship with him. These concepts took some time, but by my freshman year of college, which happened to be a Bible college, I came to know him as my savior. I can't give you a date or a time, but I can tell you this story and how God has began to transform me since that date. I'm an heir to him, his child, and I'm becoming more like him each and every day. The struggles I had were real, and they're now opportunities for me to continue learning and growing. Sin may still be a part of my life, but I'm actively engaged in God's word and apply his truths to whatever situation comes my way. By the grace of God, I leave you with this. He chose me, and he wants all of you as well. There's no sin too big, no person too dirty to be adored by the creator himself. He loves and cherishes me, and now I have the platform to share him with you guys. I may still not be so great at dealing with anxiousness or control, but I can have a firm peace knowing that the Lord of all is in control of every step of every life, including mine and yours too. Your struggles, sin, pain, and all those tears are real, and he can and will use them. So let him do his work through you, and you'll see the plan start to unfold. Thank you.
<clears throat> thank you everybody for sharing your your testimonies about uh, how the Lord worked in your heart uh, and saved you from uh, sin and brought you to himself his rich grace <clears throat> so Orangeville Baptist Church we have that <clears throat> privilege that opportunity once again to uh, cast our vote uh, for membership and so we just need again we need a motion uh, to receive these nine individuals uh, into membership based on their testimony. I think I saw Wayne Twitchell's hand first. I'll say Josiah seconded. Sound good? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed the same. So motion carries unanimously. So we praise the Lord for this morning and maybe some of these individuals who shared their faith this morning uh, maybe you don't know them too well, and hopefully today is just a, a big step in that, in that direction of getting to know them, right? And, and serving alongside one another uh, as we continue to seek to uh, saturate uh, Barry County with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so if you just bear, bear with us for a few more moments, I'm just going to ask you to turn to Romans 116. We'll look at that for a second, and then we will have the Lord's Supper together. We'll continue to celebrate uh, His rich grace uh, in our hearts and and lives. So Romans chapter 1, 16. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And God's word says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel, the gospel is what we've been celebrating this morning. Uh, we've heard 15 people share the gospel, interweaving it with their life story and how the Lord worked in their hearts and lives. We've also seen the gospel on display uh, through baptism. And in a few moments as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we, we are able to celebrate and see the gospel portrayed that way. But the gospel is very, very simple. Uh, the gospel is the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. And he rose from the dead three days later. That is the gospel. Uh, that is the saving gospel. That is good news uh, because all of us, uh, in and of ourselves, are under the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. The penalty of sin because the word of God says that the wages of sin is death. And so apart from the grace and saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single one of us are spiritually dead. Unable to move a spiritual muscle. Uh, we have no fellowship with God. We are separated from God. Uh, because we are spiritually dead, we are also slaves to sin. Uh, the Lord Jesus teaches us in John chapter 8 that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We are all under the power of sin. We're under its penalty, we're under its power, we're also under its presence. The presence of sin is within us. We can't escape it. Uh, the scriptures say in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So you can't run from sin. Uh, sin is within you, it goes with you wherever you go. So the penalty of sin, the power of sin, the presence of sin, and that's not all. Because that's true, those, those three aspects of sin, uh, we are also powerless to save ourselves, try as we might. And we try. We sure try. But you cannot save yourself. A blueberry bush cannot produce strawberries. If you come to a blueberry bush and say, hey, look, strawberries, it's not a blueberry bush, right? <laughs> it's a strawberry. If you go to Niagara Falls, <clears throat> The Niagara Falls cannot just suddenly reverse course and go up, right? That's impossible. It's impossible for water that's going down a hill or over a cliff to reverse course. And so it is impossible for us to reverse course. It is impossible for ourselves to save ourselves. Again, the scriptures say in Jeremiah, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing good evil. But listen to what Romans 1.16 says. I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. Why? For it is the power of God. It's the power of God for salvation. So the gospel is not just good news. The gospel is powerful. 
It's very powerful. It's the power of God for salvation, the power of God. It does not disappoint. It does not return void. And so the, while we are under the power of sin and its penalty and its presence and we're unable to do anything about it, God's gospel is powerful. And his gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ, is able to save you, to rescue you from your sin. The powerful gospel of God is able to break sin's penalty and it's able to break sin's power. And you've heard this morning from 15 different individuals the power of sin that God, through Christ, has broken. And that list could go on and on. Whether you struggle with anger, or bitterness, or lust, or pornography, or, or drug use, laziness, uh, divorce, racism, lying, drunkenness, abortion, greed, envy, selfishness, all these things, all these sins, you can multiply them by infinity, the gospel is able to break its power. The gospel is able to rescue you from its power. The gospel is able to remove all your shame and all your guilt because it is the power of God. And has been shared this morning, not only does it break the power of sin, but it sustains you day by day and moment by moment, breath by breath. The gospel is not something you believe once and don't think about ever again. The gospel evokes praise. The gospel reminds you of your identity in Christ. The gospel sustains you. It makes you fruitful. It strengthens you. It feeds you. It grows you. It keeps you from sin. It motivates you towards godliness. It protects you from despair. It encourages you. The gospel beats down our pride. The gospel of God is powerful. And that gospel can save you from your sin, even now. It is powerful to do that. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, but Pastor Andrew, if you knew the things that I've done, if you knew the things that I've thought, uh, if, you, if you knew what, my, what was truly in my heart, you would know that Jesus wants nothing to do with me, that I'm beyond its saving power, and Romans 1.16 refutes that. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. To who? Everyone. Everyone who believes. So who is the gospel for? Everyone. The gospel is the everyone gospel. The gospel is for uh, the, the transgender person. The gospel is for the homosexual. The person with the criminal record. The one who everyone else considered too far gone. Uh, the one forgotten and all who are lost. The gospel is for the person who annoys you. It's for the person you disagree with. Jesus can save anyone and everyone if you will recognize your sin and turn to him. There is no one beyond his saving power. The gospel can handle your deepest secrets and your deepest struggles things that no one else knows about, and if they knew about it, you'd be horrified, right? The gospel is the power of God and can save you and cleanse you from all your sin, from all your guilt, from all your shame. The gospel is the everyone gospel. How do you come to know this salvation? Well, the verse goes on to say, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's so simple. It's not by works. It's not by doing all this list of things you think you have to do. No, that's all been done for you, and his name is Jesus. And he bore God's wrath. He bore the penalty of sin and the power of sin and the presence of sin on the cross. And by faith in his name and faith in his name alone, you can have salvation. You can become his child you can be cleansed from your sin. What does that mean to have your faith in Christ? It is to say to Jesus, I believe you took my sin and you bore my shame. You rose to life. You defeated the grave. I, I believe that I'm a sinner and powerless and broken and unable to save myself, but you, God, are mighty to save. I, I believe I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness, and in Jesus Christ, in his name only, I find forgiveness. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what belief is. It's 
placing all your faith and hope and trust, leaning wholly and solely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith, that's saving faith. So the most critical question facing you right now, <clears throat> every single one of us, it's not who's gonna win the election in a few days. It's not COVID. It's not your financial situation. It's this, how can I be made right with God? How can I be made right with God? And our passage says it comes through believing. Faith alone in Christ alone who died on the cross for our sin and rose from the dead. There is no other way. There is no other salvation. Place your faith in him alone today. If you have questions about that and would like to talk more about that, and that's why we're here and we're glad you're here and I hope you will do that. Uh, but you don't need to walk the aisle. You don't need to do anything but just right now cry out to God, I'm a sinner, please save me. And he loves you and he will do that. The th other thing I would just encourage you to think about is if you're here this morning and you're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're trusting in, in him alone for your salvation, uh, my question to you is have you been baptized? Have you followed through in that step of obedience? Uh, Joanne is, is a huge encouragement to me. Uh, that, that after many years of serving the Lord, the Lord worked in her heart and showed her that step of obedience to be taken. How awesome is that? Uh, no reason why they can't be true of each one of us here. Have you been baptized? Have you experienced that public expression of following Christ? If you love Jesus but haven't been baptized, what are you waiting for? You're not going to regret it. And following up from that, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been baptized, are you a member of a local Christ-honoring, the Word of God-centered kind of local church? That's just the next natural step, right? If Jesus has saved you, if you love Jesus, you love his people. Those, those things go together. Following Jesus and being with his people, it's like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> they just go together. Read Acts chapter 2 where Peter proclaims the gospel and 3,000 come to faith in him. And after they're baptized, what's the next thing they do? Just read it in Acts chapter 2, 42. They immediately devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. It's just a natural response. When, when God saves you from your sin and brings you to his son, Jesus Christ, you want to be with those who love him and serve him, and you want to serve alongside with him. And that's what church membership is. It's committing to a body of believers to love and serve one another. It's committing to a body of believers to display that gospel to others, because we can't do it alone. We're not meant to do it alone. So if you're here this morning and you're not a member of Orangeville Baptist Church, what are you waiting for? Let's work together uh, to saturate Barry County with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, amen? amen. And so that leads us to just this, this final celebration of the gospel. I, I know it's still a little bit weird doing it this way <laughs> uh, with, with this, the cup, uh, the juice is in the bottom, on the very top is, is the wafer or piece of whatever that is. <laughs> Uh, but this, this is how we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. I just would remind you how this pictures the gospel. Uh, the cup pictures, or the cup of juice uh, pictures the blood of Jesus Christ. And his blood alone there is found forgiveness. And so by, by drinking this uh, and by eating the bread that represents his body broken for us on the cross, to emphasize it again, this does not and cannot and will never save you. And this does not impress God. What this is, is a response of gratitude and celebration that God and his love has redeemed you. It's a reminder of how badly you need him day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. That's, that's what this is. Uh, and so I'm going to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Hopefully everyone has one of these. If not, I do see a few extra ones sitting around if, if you need one. Uh, does anyone need one? Put your hand up. We can get it to you. Over here. Could someone get one over here? Uh, the first, first Corinthians chapter 11, I went right by it, and I'm going to go ahead and read this passage, and then we'll go ahead and uh, 
and, and move forward with it. But it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, so go ahead and pull out that piece of bread. And then we take the cup and do this in remembrance of him also. And I'm going to go ahead and pray and give thanks to him. And I invite the worship team to, to come up. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do uh, just rejoice in today and these 15 individuals who have uh, joined the church through membership and testimony. Lord, we, we ask that it's, it's just the beginning. Uh, we, we read in Acts about how daily uh, you added to your church those who were being saved. And Lord, we would ask and cry that that would be the same here, that, that you would be so pleased to magnify and glorify your name that, that day by day we have, we have more and more people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, looking to you alone for forgiveness of sins, for a righteousness that it can only be uh, brought to us by you and for you who wipe away guilt and shame, Lord, that, that, that many would just see their sin and look to you, especially during this time, that our hope would not be anywhere else, not in our bank accounts, uh, not in who wins the election, uh, not in uh, finding a cure for COVID, but that it would be in Christ and Christ alone. That, that would be our heart's cry. Uh, and that we would just uh, think much on him and help us as a, as a church family to go forth from here uh, thinking much on Christ, dwelling much on Christ, and to be great witnesses for Christ. Help us to saturate all of Barry County with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we uh, seek to, sp uh, in, in the way that we speak and the way that we act and, and, and all these things, Lord, that Christ would be evident, so that they would see you in us and hear you in us, that you would be praised and glorified in this way. And we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you quickly before you go. The church is having a concert this next Sunday night. So if you like a little quartet music, a little southern gospel, enjoy me and Merlin singing together. Come on out next Sunday. Other than that, thank you for being part of our family and have a blessed week. You are dismissed.